Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Lisa Vijos, and it is my great pleasure and honor to welcome you to Mead Public Library this evening for this event that is being held in celebration of National Poetry Month. The event is Poetic Pairings, How Poetry Speaks. And tonight, you're going to hear from 10 different members of our community, people who maybe hadn't ever thought of themselves as having anything to do with poetry necessarily, but I asked them to pick a poem that had meaning to them, something maybe from childhood or more recent times, something that inspired them or kept them, kept them going, gave them pause. So those 10 individuals picked a poem, and then I paired them with um, a colleague friend of friends of mine, the poets from Mead Library Circle, Poetry Circle. So we meet here at the library once a month and we share poetry with each other. And so the poets from this group are being paired with the community members. And the idea, I keep describing this event as dancing with the stars, but in poetry form. So you'll see um, some wonderful exchanges as the poetic pairs unfold. And what I'm going to do is I'll introduce each pair um, and then I'll let them introduce the poem that they're sharing. Now, some of the pairs are reading one poem together back and forth. Some of the pairs, one person is reading one poem and the next person is reading something in response. So you're going to want to be um, listening for what it is that's kind of creating a conversation between the poems, and we'll see what happens. And uh, at the end of the evening, we'll eat lots of cupcakes and drink iced tea and talk about it. So without further ado, let me introduce our first two, our first pair. Do you guys want to come and stand up here so I can, as I'm speaking about you people, see who you are? So Corey Andreessen is a math teacher at Sheboygan North High and the 2015 recipient of a Presidential Award for Excellence in Mathematics and Science Teaching. And 2013, sorry, thank you. You told me that, the, yeah, okay. And his partner this evening is Leanne Metter Jensen, also a poet and a language arts teacher at Central High School. So, take it away, you two. I'll be back. Okay. Right. And you can follow. <laughs> so we were uh, we met at Paradigm, and for whatever reason, I was just getting images because that's what poetry does. But created this. Uh, I know it's kind of hard to see um, after the poem. Maybe after uh, everyone's read, if you have questions, you can ask me about. Okay. Yeah. Can you introduce the poem? What do you mean by introduce the poem? Just say the name and the poem's name. Okay, there we go. Uh, Instructions by Neil Gaiman. It comes to the wooden gate in the wall you never saw before. Say please before you open the latch. Go through, walk down the path. A red metal imp hangs from the green painted front door as a knocker. Do not touch it. It will bite your fingers. Mm -hmm. Walk through the house, take nothing. Eat nothing. However, if any creature tells you that it hungers, feed it. If it tells you that it is dirty, clean it. If it cries to you that it hurts, if you can, ease its pain. From the back garden, you will be able to see the wild wood. The deep well you walk past leads to winter's realm. There is another land at the bottom of it. If you turn around here, you can walk back, safely. You will lose no face. I will think no less of you. Once through the garden, you will be in the wood. The trees are old. Eyes peer from the undergrowth. Beneath a twisted oak sits an old woman. She may ask for something. Give it to her. She will point the way to the castle. Inside it are three princesses. Do not trust the youngest. <laughs> Walk on. In the clearing beyond the castle, the twelve months sit about a fire. Warming their feet. Exchanging tales. 
They may do favors for you. If you are polite. You may pick strawberries in December's frost. Trust the wolves. But do not tell them where you are going. The river can be crossed by the ferry. The ferryman will take you. The answer to his question is this. If he hands the oar to his passenger, he will be free to leave the boat. Only tell him from a safe distance. If an eagle gives you a feather, keep it safe. Remember that giants sleep too soundly, that witches are often betrayed by their appetites. Dragons have one soft spot. Somewhere. Always. Hearts can be well hidden. And you betray them with your tongue. Do not be jealous of your sister. Know that diamonds and roses are as uncomfortable when they tumble from one's lips as toads and frogs. Colder, too, and sharper. And they cut. Remember your name. Do not lose hope. What, what you, you seek will, will be found. found. Trust ghosts. Trust those that you have helped to help you in their turn. Trust dreams. Trust your heart. And trust, trust your, your story. story. When you come back, return the way you came. Favors will be returned. Debts will be repaid. Do not forget your manners. Do not look back. Ride the wise eagle. You shall not fall. Ride the silver fish. You will not drown. Ride the gray wolf. Hold tightly to his fur. There is a worm at the heart of the tower. And that is why it will not stand. When you reach the little house, the place your journey started, you will recognize it. Although, it will seem much smaller than you remember. Walk up the path, and through the garden gate you never saw before but once. And then, go home. Or make a home. And, and rest. rest. Tobin, do you guys want to come up here for the introduction? Xia Gu Yang was born in Namhet, Laos, received his master's degree in chemical engineering in Lyon, France. Bu speaks five languages. He came to Sheboygan in 1981, and he's the co-founder of the Lao Hmong and American Veterans Memorial in, at, the, at the Deland Park. Bu is also the owner of the Union Oriental Market. And I found out today, by doing some reading about you, the founder of the Nonghet Library and Learning Center, which opened in his homeland in 2010. And Jean Tobin is a watercolor artist, a poet, the co-founder of Glacial Lakes Conservancy, and Professor Emerita of English with the University of Wisconsin Colleges. And they have some poems to share with you, and I'll let you introduce your poem, okay? I feel good to have Jean with me. <laughs> uh, I wrote this poem uh, for someone that I would leave behind as I was going to go to France for higher education. And she would stay behind and waiting for me, my return. Unfortunately, things did not work out exactly what I dreamed, and so we were apart forever. And the poem was talking about the leaving, the feeling. Uh, I had no idea that 45 years later I had to stand in front of you, <laughs> such a you know, audience, and uh, I'm a little bit shaky because I'm not a poet. And especially, I had to read it in front of mayor of Sheboygan, too. <laughs> so bear with me. I'm going to read in Hmong, and Jane will read in English. 
so the translation is pretty close. And here we go. Departure. 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 Guyo Jai Mu. Kanzu Ji. Le Mashua Te. Ji Tok Pua Mo. Shot Pua Mo. Lua Nya Toku. Tili Mo Shia Sa Mo. Blooming flower, I am leaving now. I leave to study abroad in a foreign country. Please do not cry. Dry your sweet tears. Smile for me instead to give me courage to leave. <laughs> If fortune favors us, we will have a happy life. I will return with a bright future. We will hold hands like insects and birds that fly through the air, hopping with happiness. My blooming flower, remember my sweet words that I said to you a long time ago. Remember these words. Wait for me. It will be a short time. I will come back to you. Dipachia, Uyun Jai Mu, Kanzuki, Le Mashuate, Jisakua Mo, Shakua Mo, Luanya Toku, Tilly Mushia Samu. Blooming flower, I am leaving now. I leave to study abroad in a foreign country. Please do not cry. Dry your sweet tears. Smile for me instead to give me courage to leave. That's the end. one by Ezra Pound. And like this one, which was translated by Boo's daughter, and I think beautifully translated, the poem I'll read is in translation. It is a poem by the 18th century um, Chinese poet, and it is translated by Ezra Pound. The poet is Ri Ha Ku, and the poem, sorry, and the poem is The River Merchant's Wife, A Letter. I chose it because it made me appreciate Vu's poem even more. Um, I think his poem is beautiful. The emotion is expressed not directly, but indirectly through the birds, through the insects. Um, and I think you'll find the same thing true of this poem. In this case, the river merchant's wife, a letter, she has been left and she waits. While my hair was still cut straight across my forehead, played I about the front gate, pulling flowers. You came by on bamboo stilts, playing horse. You walked about my seat, playing with blue plums. And we went on living in the village of Chokan, two small people, without dislike or suspicion. At 14, I married my lord, you. I never laughed, being bashful. Lowering my head, I looked at the wall. Called to a thousand times, I never looked back. At 15, I stopped scowling. 
I desired my dust to be mingled with yours forever and forever and forever. Why should I plan the lookout? At 16, you departed. You went into far Kutoyen by the river of swirling eddies, and you have been gone five months. The monkeys make sorrowful noise overhead. You dragged your feet when you went out. By the gate now, the moss is grown, the different mosses too deep to clear them away. The leaves fall early this autumn in wind. The paired butterflies are already yellow with August out and over the grass in the West Garden. They hurt me. I grow older. If, if you are coming down through the narrows of the River Kian, please let me know beforehand, and I will come out to meet you as far as Chofusa. Our mayor, Mike Vandersteen. Mayor Vandersteen is originally from Manitowoc. Green Bay. Green Bay. Sorry. <laughs> Catherine Gall is a writer, a dancer, and a registered nurse. She grew up with seven siblings on a farm just up the road from here in Cleveland. And I will let them introduce what they're going to share. Thank you very much. Um, when raising our children, Robert and Katie, we took advantage of the opportunity to read them many books. But this one, The Giving Tree by Shel Silverstein, had a, an element of sacrifice in it that was, I think, a really good message. And um, the other thing that, that brought me to this is the fact that Sheboygan is, is uh, celebrating its uh, 28th year being a Tree City USA community. And at the end of this month, on the 29th at Fountain Park from 9 to 11, we'll be celebrating Arbor Day. So there's a lot of things that, that, that uh, drew me to this. So with that, we'll begin. Once there was a tree, and she loved a little boy. And every day, the boy would come. And he would gather her leaves, and make them into crowns, and play king of the forest. He would climb up her trunk and swing from her branches and eat apples, and they would play. I'd go seek, and when he was tired, he would sleep in her shade, and the boy loved the tree very much, and the tree was happy. But time went by, and the boy grew older, and the tree was often alone. Then one day the boy came to the tree, and the tree said, Come, boy, come and climb up my trunk, and swing from my branches, and eat apples, and play in my shade, and be happy. I am too big to climb and play, said the boy. I want to buy things and have fun. I want some money. Can you give me some money? I am sorry, said the tree, but I have no money. I have only leaves and apples. Take my apples, boy, and sell them in the city. Then you will have money, and you will be happy. And so the boy climbed up the tree and gathered her apples. He carried them away, and the tree was happy. But the boy stayed away for a long time, and the tree was sad. And then one day, the boy came back, and the tree shook with joy. And she said, Come, boy, climb up my trunk and swing from my branches and be happy. I am too busy to climb trees, said the boy. I want a house to keep me warm, he said. I want a wife. I want children. And so I need a house. Can you give me a house? I have no house, said the tree. 
The forest is my house, but you may cut off my branches and build a house. Then you will be happy. And the, so the boy cut off her branches and carried them away to build his house. And the tree was happy. But the boy stayed away for a long time. And when he did come back, the tree was so happy, she could hardly speak. Come, boy, she whispered. Come and play. I am too old and sad to play, said the boy. I want a boat that will take me far away from here. Can you give me a boat? Cut down my trunk and make a boat, said the tree. Then you can sail away and be happy. And so the boy cut down her trunk and made a boat and sailed away. And the tree was happy. But not really. <laughs> After a long time, the boy came back again. I'm sorry, boy, said the tree, but I have nothing left to give you. My apples are gone. My teeth are too weak for the apples, said the boy. My branches are gone, said the tree. You cannot swing on them. I am too old to swing on branches, said the boy. My trunk is gone, said the tree. You cannot climb. I am too tired to climb, said the boy. I am sorry, sighed the tree. I wish that I could give you something, but I have nothing left. I am just an old stump. I am sorry. I don't need much now, said the boy. Just a quiet place to sit and rest. I am very tired. Well, said the tree, straightening herself up as much as she could. Well, an old stump is good for sitting and resting. Come, boy, sit down. Sit down and rest. And the boy did. And the tree was happy. The, the end. end. <laughs> you guys were great. And you actually color coordinated. Did you know that? <laughs> <laughs> Black line and awesome. Thank you. So our next pair is Leslie Laster and Sylvia Kavanaugh. Leslie is a school counselor at Horace Mann Middle School and a graduate of Lakeland College. Sylvia Cavanaugh is a poet, a social studies teacher at North High, and the head of the North High Poetry Club. Yes? All right, so take it away. We're going to read Still I Rise by Maya Angelou. You may write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still, like dust, I'll rise. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? Because I walk like I've got oil wells pumping in my living room? Just like moons and like suns, with the certainty of tides. Just like hope springing high, still, I'll rise. Did you want to see me broken? bowed head and lowered eyes, shoulders falling down like teardrops, weakened by my soulful cries. Does my haughtiness offend you? Don't you take it awful hard? Cause I laugh like I've got gold mines digging in my own backyard. You may shoot me with your words, you may cut me with your eyes, you may kill me with your hatefulness, but still, like air, I'll rise. Does my sexiness upset you? Does it come as a surprise? Sorry, got my eyes dilated. <laughs> 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 then I dance like I've got diamonds at the meeting of my thighs. Out of the huts of history's shame. I can't see. <laughs> I rise. Up from a past that's rooted in pain, I rise. I'm a black ocean, leaping and wide, welling and swelling, I bear in the tide. Oh, man. It's getting worse. <laughs> 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 All right. Leaving behind. I can't, I can't. This one might be a little 
Yeah. 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 Leaving behind nights of terror and fear. I rise into a daybreak that's wondrously clear. I rise bringing the gifts that my ancestor gave. I am the dream and the hope of the slave. I rise, I rise, I rise. <laughs> We should be careful not to go get our eyes dilated with the eye doctor for poetry readings. Thank you. Hold it off. Our next pair is Janet Ross and John Serpinski, if you guys can come forward. Janet Ross is a dedicated community volunteer all over Sheboygan. She's volunteered at John Michael Kohler Art Center. The Sheboygan Area School District and the Literacy Council. John Serpinski is a poet. John has studied poetry at University of Wisconsin, Marquette, Iowa Writers Workshop, and the Vest Conservatory for Writers. And he lives in Plymouth. And I will let Janet introduce her poem. I bumped into this poem, poem a number of years ago. I brought it with me. It's one of two that I brought with me in our early morning discussion group that Lisa and I are part of. I brought the, both of them because I hoped I could read them instead of the poem that was in the book that we were reading. <laughs> and I snapped you up. And it just happened to, I just happened to have them with me. That was the morning that Lisa suggested I might be involved. She looked at the two poems. This poem got bumped into for a second time. <laughs> <clears throat> Hope is a long, slow thing. Say the poet's name. Oh, by Mars <laughs> Piercy. <clears throat> Hope. I became a feminist, but I didn't get it all, so I had committed to the Church of Perpetual Subservience, unquote. I protested, demonstrated, but still the war went on, so I had realized that politics is useless, and I had joined the Junior League instead. We had marvelous luncheons, <laughs> I made phone calls to my candidate, but little happened, so I'll never vote again. <laughs> But progress is never individual. A wave crashes on our shore, traveling all the way from Africa, storming, eroding the cliff, grinding it down, but the same water is not what moved. We are droplets in a wave. Maybe I cannot, with my efforts, displace a rock, but the energy of a movement can force it from the way. Look back. My great-grandmother was killed in a pogrom. My grandmother gave birth to 11 children in a tenement eating potatoes only sometimes. My mother had to leave school in 10th grade to work as a chambermaid that salesmen chased around dirty beds. Nothing changed by itself but was changed by work. History records no progress people did not sweat and dare to push. <coughs> Along we is the power that moves the rock. It's called Worn Out. Still working. I still feel the same about it today. <laughs> so, worn out. In the 1930s, my Polish grandfather's body became knotted from crawling under brew house machines and fitting copper pipe. His muscles broke down, his spine became moth eaten. The company he worked for let him go without any pay or benefits. He turned to booze then died on his way home from the saloon. 
1957, my Russian father walked the picket line for 17 long weeks. He had only the union dole of 12 bucks per week to feed four of us. We ate eggs, potatoes, and shit on a shingle. The corporation, the old harness beggar, now Joy Global, is still strong today. Not so my father. He's gone. My father worked 10 hour days, six days a week, black grease under his fingernails. As he lay dying of esophageal cancer, the HR rep came to the hospital with an engraved silver plated dish in recognition of 35 years of service. My story. I bounced in an 18-wheeler, dragged off 2,000-pound pallets of bagged pea gravel and turned 5,000-pound steel reels of cable on January ice, all so that construction had their supplies. I helped raise three kids while I scratched poetry on the back of my lunch bag. When I hit 50, my doctor said, some of the discs in your back have thinned and one is bulging. Okay, so now tell me about how hard working people need to take big cuts in pay and benefits. Tell me how the union busters, the one percenters, the golden parachuters are really the job creators. Then tell me again how tea partiers with their absurd white stockings and their little three-cornered hats are going to make it better for all of us. Thank you all. Two poems about work from different perspectives. Our next pair is half of the pair is Jim Kettler. <laughs> Jim has a PhD in ecology from the University of Georgia. He taught at the Graduate School of Environmental Studies at Bard College and ran its International Honors Program for 10 years. And currently he is the Executive Director of the Lakeshore Natural Resource Partnership. And Jim was paired with a poet named Jean Began, but Jean wasn't able to be with us tonight. And so Jim is going to read the poem that he selected, and I'm going to read what Jean was going to read in response to the poem. So you begin, and then I will follow. Thanks, I'm going to be reading a poem by Gary Snyder, who almost connected poetry to the earth I love, as for poets. As for poets, the earth poets, who write small poems, need help from no man. The air poets play out the swiftest scales and sometimes lull in the eddies, poem after poem curling back on the same thrust. At 50 below, fuel oil won't flow and propane stays in the tank. Fire poets burn at absolute zero fossil love pumped back up. The first water poet stayed down six years. He was covered with seaweed. The life in his poem left millions of tiny different tracks crisscrossing through the mud. With the sun and moon in his belly, the space poet sleeps. No end to the sky, but his poems like wild geese fly off the edge. A mind poet stays in the house. The house is empty and it has no walls. The poem is seen from all sides, everywhere at once. Thank you. And Jean Began was going to read a poem that she herself wrote in response, well, she didn't write it in response to this, but she thought it was a good response to this Gary Snyder poem, and her poem is called Homespun. I patch beat down lines in poems, though most hold up rightly without me. I sit inside their thin layers, too tired to stick my head out. Oh, workaday verses, not tricky nor starched. They do start truly enough, 
but leave me dwindled and sad, like something that could be, isn't, like echoes in Orphan Annie's tune, tomorrow, tomorrow. I come from women who ate parts no one else grabbed, necks, wings, gristle bits, apples wormed and brown at their cores. I ball up in dished out casserole poems, compelled but hopeful of sweet distant outcomes. I've waited so long for mangoes or a swell vacation to a beach where flowered breezes would sing me queen. I want a silver fast dreamy jet to fly me to new lands and real pearl buttons on my dresses and every seam to last. Thank you. Okay, so our next pair is Jim Hollister and Carl Elder. Jim Hollister is pastor at First Congregational Church here in Sheboygan. He's an avid cyclist, blogger, and seeker of truth. <laughs> and he attended Union Theological Seminary in New York City. Carl Elder is the Jacob and Lucille Fessler Professor of Creative Writing at Lakeland College. He's also the founder and leader of the Mead Poetry Circle. Gentlemen. Thank you, Lisa and Carl. Good to be with you. One more little plug for my alma mater, which another alma mater, Colgate University. I was an English major, as was my wife, and uh, at a different school she was. And I studied with a new professor when I was early on in my education in the early 80s. And uh, I took a class with Peter Balakian called the American Novel. 35 years later or so, just a week or two ago, I found out he just won the Pulitzer Prize for Poetry this past couple weeks ago. So that was kind of cool. I never had a poetry class, though, even though I was a English major. I did some survey <coughs> classes with lots of poems, of course. So I'm going to read Pablo Neruda, Keeping Quiet, and uh, I honestly don't remember how I found it. It may have been through the website On Being with Krista Tippett. It may have been referred to there. And then I started looking at other translations, and I ended up picking this translation by Alistair Reed, which may have been the, the version that she had on her website. And Lisa had said just tonight, we pick a poem or it picks us that gives us pause. And so you'll see how this one gives us pause. Now we will count to 12, and we will all keep still. For once on the face of the earth, let's not speak in any language. Let's stop for one second and not move our arms so much. It would be an exotic moment without rush, without engines. We would all be together in a sudden strangeness. Fishermen in the cold sea would not harm whales, and the man gathering salt would look at his hurt hands. Those who prepare green wars, wars with gas, wars with fire, victories with no survivors, would put on clean clothes and walk about with their brothers in the shade, doing nothing. What I want should not be confused with total inactivity. Life is what it's about. I want no truck with death. If we were not so single-minded about keeping our lives moving, and for once could do nothing, perhaps a huge silence might interrupt this sadness of never understanding ourselves and of threatening ourselves with death. Perhaps the earth can teach us, as when everything seems dead and later proves to be alive. Now I'll count up to 12, and you keep quiet, and I will go. <laughs> Very 
Thank you, Jim. When I uh, saw the piece uh, over uh, email on the Ruby piece, I uh, instantly thought of the piece I'm going to read you now by David Hilton. David Hilton is a poet who, uh, she had an artist from originally, but I met him when he was a fairly young man working on a doctorate degree in, in Madison. And uh, what else I can tell you, I suppose, is, uh, uh, well, this piece is called In Praise of Big Pens. <laughs> now, I've got to give you the context. He wrote this piece at the time at which big pens were all the rage, that is, you know, the 19th cent big pen. And we saw all kinds of television commercials. You recall. Well, some of us will recall it. <laughs> they did all kinds of strange things to this pen. They shot the sucker. And of course, the theme, well, they jammed it in there. Peggy Fleming, a great uh, Olympic skater, jammed it into the ice with her skate. And, and then they put butcher paper up on the wall and smeared it with butter, and the sucker still wrote. <laughs> So that's the context. I suppose the poem was written about uh, 1968, 1969, something like that. In praise of big pens, others always skip over the word that will bring the belligerence of the world to the negotiating table. If only I can get it written, or teach them kids in Wotown, West Virginia to rebound tough and read Ted Rethke. I'm riding along in a conspiracy of birds and sun and pom-pom girls, lines to cheer old ladies with shopping bags, waiting by their bus stops at 5 p.m., or lines to get the 12-year-olds off cigarettes, or save the suicides in gay bar men's rooms, or save the fat man from his refrigerator, or the brilliant boy from Color TV, or the RA private from re-upping for six, or the whole Midwest from wanting to conquer Asia and the moon, or the current president from his place in history. Oh, if only I could get it written. No one will burn kittens, or slap little boys, or make little girls cry, or cower at cancer, or coronaries, or plain palsied old age, or get goofy from radiation in his cornflake milk. If only I can get it written. But always, when I get close to the word, and the crowd begins to roar, the common pen skips, leaves the page blank. But you, big pen, at 19 cents, could trace truth terms on tank trends. <laughs> could ratify in the most flourishing script the amnesty of love for our most dreaded enemies. The ugly, the poor, the stupid, the sexually screwed up. Etching their releases across the slippery communities of generals and governors. For behold, you can write upon blotter. Yea, inscribe, even to a slide. But at 19 cents, no one pays attention to the dead wood you shatter or the manifestos you slice in the ice. For who would believe truth at that price? <laughs> <laughs> back table when we're when we're done with the reading you might want to check out the back table I tried to gather as many books as I could that have in them the poems that are being shared tonight the the David Hilton poem is in the book called 180 the anthology that um, Billy Collins put together the Neruda books I couldn't find the exact I couldn't find the poem in any books in the library so but there's some books by Neruda there's a book by Gary Snyder, so later you can check those out. And those are all 
ready to be taken out, so they're available. If you walk through the, Jeannie said that the, the alarm will go off, but don't worry, just keep walking. I mean, don't go that way, go that way and take the book out, uh, you know, check it out. Check it out, don't take it out. All right. Um, our next pair is Romina Yuseda and Jerry Birch. Do you guys want to come up? Romi, Romina or Romi is a supply chain manager at Kohler Company. She studied international relations at Brigham Young University and she's originally from Chile. And Jerry Birch is a retired UCC pastor and a poet living here in Sheboygan. He grew up on the plains of South Dakota and he went to school in a one-room schoolhouse for six years. And they are going to read something together. I will let Romeo let you introduce the poem and then you guys take it away. And he's also a graduate of Union Seminary in New York City, <laughs> Jim Hall's. Okay, so this, uh, this poem is called Piezas Eagles, and it's from Gabriela Vistel. So it's from a Chilean poet, very well known, uh, just like Pablo Neruda. And um, she was the first uh, woman in Latin America to win a Nobel Prize in 1945. And it's a strong woman, and I love strong women. So, um, so yeah, so we're going to read this. And it's about uh, little kids. So, Piezas Eagles de Niño, Azulosos de Frío. ¿Cómo os ven y no os cubren, Dios mío? Tiny feet. A child's tiny feet. Blue. Blue with cold. How can they see and not protect you? Oh, my God. Piececitos heridos por los hijarros todos, ultrajados de nieves y lodos. Tiny, wounded feet. Bruised all over by pebbles. A bruised, abused by snow and soil. El hombre ciego ignora <clears throat> que por donde pasáis, una flor de luz viva dejáis. Man, being blind, ignores that where you step. You leave a blossom of bright light that where you have placed your bleeding little souls, a red, redolent, Tuberose grows. I don't use those words. Que allí donde ponéis la plantita sangrante, el nardo nace más fragante. Since, however, you walk through the streets so straight, you are courageous without fault. Sed, puesto que marcháis por los caminos rectos, heroicos como sois perfectos. Child's tiny feet. Two suffering little gems. How can the people pass on seeing? Piecitos de niño, dos joyitas sufrientes. ¿Cómo pasan sin veros las gentes? I think we got off sync. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I am going to share something. <clears throat> this is one of my prairie poems. Um, <clears throat> it was uh, included uh, in a volume published by the American Historical Society of Germans from Russia, published in 2009. <clears throat> the society is located in Lincoln, Nebraska. <clears throat> this is actually an excerpt from a poem um, about a child, um, our youngest grandson, to be exact. And this is a capitulation of his personality, which is still evident at age 10. Conquer. Don't explore. Conquer. The little mind with all its potential directs the action. Don't wait. Do it now. 
as the little heart demands. Don't think about it. Act, the child's spirit says. Don't examine it. Tip it over. Don't ask. But he couldn't if he wanted to. He doesn't have the vocabulary to support an explanation. When you're 19 months, don't philosophize. <laughs> Do what comes naturally. Every day is your own little Everest waiting to be climbed and conquered. Thank you. Our next pair is Carol Dussault and Marianne Hurt. Carol is a retired teacher in the Sheboygan Area School District and currently the Direct Services Coordinator for the Literacy Council. And Marianne Hurt is a retired hospice nurse and a poet who just recently returned from the Scissor Tail Creative Writing Festival in Ada, Oklahoma. So take it away, lady. So in my work um, at the Literacy Council with volunteer tutors and adult learners, and actually Mary Ann is one of our volunteer tutors, um, I've met many people from other countries. And I've heard along the way some very sad stories, particularly from those who are refugees. Um, all of these stories come with voices full of longing for one's home country. So we're reading an uh, excerpt <clears throat> from a poem called Searching for Home by Ruth Behar. Um, at the present time, there may be as many as 200 million people living outside the country of their birth. To be able to travel like most of us, especially with the comforts of home, is a privilege. Those who move about the world without being uprooted from their homes forget this basic fact too easily. Home is a concrete location on a map. Home is a set of memories that can't be confined to any map. Home is the street where you took your first steps. Home is the land your ancestors fought for and lost. Home is your kin, those you hold dear. Home is the cornfield, the olive trees, the herd of sheep from which you were fed. Home is the heart, the home fire, the kitchen that gathers family and friends. Home is the way your grandmother said your name like a blessing. Home is the lullaby your mother sang you to sleep. Home is a shared language where even your slightest gestures are understood. Home is shelter, the house, the apartment, the flat, the shack, the tent, where you can find rest and refuge from the natural elements from heat, rain, cold, snow, and tempests. Home is where you were born and dreamed of new horizons. Home is that place where you can be a woman alone and no one feels sorry for you. Home is that place where you went to bed hungry. Home is that place where you weren't allowed to pray openly. Home is that place where you weren't afraid to wear a hijab or a kippah in the street. Home is that place of endless war and strife where you never felt safe. Home is that place from which you were expelled, told to leave or lose your life. Home is that place where your ancestors found their final resting place. Home is that place that took you in like an orphan when you had no place to go. I have a, a home home. It's called Snail Time. The snail on my parents' front walk paces it slow, but sometime will get their crawl to the azalea bush. Leaves just a trace of coming and going. His shell of both shelter and what seems to be a bag too heavy to carry. Inside, my mother lies in a hospital bed that almost swallows her. My father marks a trail between the kitchen and her bed, brings her reheated coffee, tiny comfort in a long day. I ask my father about the snail, the heavy shell, the long, slow crawl. You do what you have to do. Okay, we are at our last pair. 
which is Trisha Martin and Marilyn Zilke Window. And so, do you guys want to? Do you see where you're? Can you bring it? <laughs> okay. Trisha Martin is a pianist, piano teacher, and director of Martin's Music Studio here in Sheboygan, and she's taken a theatrical vein on her poem today. And Marilyn Zilke Window is a visual artist and a poet and retired art teacher who studied printmaking at UW-Madison and lives now in Sheboygan Falls. And this is the light, the light ending to our, our evening, so take it away. When Aunt Selena comes to tea, she always makes them send for me, and I must be polite and clean, and seldom heard but always seen. And I must sit stiffly in my chair as long as Aunt Selena's there. But there are things I would ask Aunt Selena if I could. I'd ask if she had ever, if she, when she was young like me, if she had ever climbed a tree, or if she'd ever, ever gone without her shoes and stockings on, where lovely puddles lay in rows and let the mud squeeze through her toes, or if she'd coasted on a sled, or learned to stand upon her head and wave her feet. And after that, I'd ask her how she got so fat. <laughs> These things I'd like to ask, and then I hope she would not come again. <laughs> And you know, I have met you. It's a little dramatic. My poem is called A Childhood Visit. <coughs> the Scotty dog, our only toy, knew how to behave. He, who stood stiff legged, closed jawed, black, in the corner, under the window seat, with perked ears, listened. He knew. He had a red plaid collar. He was stuffed, not allowed, at table. We were, but not to speak. Great Aunt Anna, with tight gray, braid-pinned circle hair, who Mom, through family rights, called Annie, served us ham and dill pickles from a barrel in the backyard in Milwaukee. We saw it. It was wooden and had scum on the brine surface where the pickles bobbed. I didn't say a word. I just threw up. <laughs> German was spoken. The bathroom was tiled in black and white. The towel was stiff on my lip. Courteous apologies were offered. Come agains were proffered. Dad drove home, mom's usual journey. A White Sox game voiced balls, not strikes. I slept in the back window shelf of the Studebaker all the way to Chicago, purged. Well, that brings us to the end of our pairings, but I hope that you will stay for a bit, and we've got lots of cupcakes. We have tea and water and maybe juice, um, so stay and talk, and one other thing I want to let you all know that we did in the library for National Poetry Month is we wanted to have some kind of an interactive um, activity for 
library patrons to do so. Jeannie and I worked out a system where we set up some writing stations out in the library. And if you're feeling moved, you know, as you're heading out, the library is still open for an hour, a half hour, sorry, till eight. Um, visit one of the writing stations. It, there's a little worksheet there. I'm, now I'm being like the teacher. And it gives you some simple instructions to write a very short, what's called an ekphrastic poem. An ekphrastic poem is a poem that is inspired by another work of art from the Greek word ekphrasis, meaning description. Anyway, and you can go and write your own little short poem. They're very simple to do. There's one on the stair, there's a station on the stairwell, and there's another writing station over by the wall where the James Michael watercolors are. So now that you've all been inspired and moved by all these wonderful pairings, I hope you'll make poetry more a part of your life. Read it, share it, find it, bump into it, as Janet shared, and um, just have fun. And hope maybe we'll do this event again next year. So thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you to all the poetic prayers. Thank you very much.